Hello and welcome. This is the level two recording for uh, November 3rd or November 3rd and uh, lessons for full spectrum humans. So I'm doing this week an overview of all the basic concepts that I go through for anyone who just doesn't even know where, how to dive in, where, how, what to do, how to access, how to understand what I'm talking about in terms of flying rainbow lasagna. So usually what I do is level one is beginner stuff or, or initiatory stuff and level two is advanced stuff. And what I'm doing today is really just going through, like playing through the song from the beginning, all of the melodies that we have learned, all of the beats and tempos that we've learned and really putting it all together. So I hope that it's not too boring and repetitive for anyone who's been in the class for a long time and I hope that it is putting all this together. Let's talk about technology and I, this is what I usually put forward in the Galactic History webinar. So it's lesson 18 of level one and then there's also supplementary stuff in level two and that's what I recorded a couple of years ago and then there's what I understand from right now. So the basic idea is that we emanated ourselves, you and I and my little dog over here, into containers for consciousness that are these beautiful organic multicellular containers. And I call them beautiful because whatever, I always use that description, whatever you feel like about your physical appearance, our cells are beautiful. Our cell structure and metabolism is beautiful. You know, we really are part of this living time field. And that's the amazing thing. We're part of this symphony of life. And I use that analogy all the time because the idea is that in a, the symphony of life, your body is your instrument. And if you are a good musician, then you get to continue playing and keep on playing music and making music and being in the symphony. And if you're not a good musician, then you don't get to be in the symphony. And let's talk about that zeroth dimension that I drew a picture of in level one. Zeroth dimension, that dot at the central convergence point at the center of this sculpture. That is, um, you know, the, the, the great composer, the great conductor, and we are all the musicians that are at that starting point. And the great conductor says, rest, rest, rest. It's not time to be born yet. Now be born, like now violins play, now kettle drums play, and we're supposed to be good musicians. I'd say, oh, look, I just got told that I'm supposed to play. It's time for me to go get born. And the way that you get born is on a bridge of love into an organic multicellular container, like the one that I'm using and the one that all of my audience and people that are on this video are using, because we're not talking to anyone who's a disembodied, you know, whatever cyborg right now. And I also have to say this too, because people are always wondering, what does it mean to be a walk-in? Are you a body snatcher? Who are you? What are you? I understand the levels of skepticism that I face on this planet and that I have to make a distinction. So yeah, there are malevolent walk-ins. There are beings that are like rapists of the genetic code or that force themselves into people's bodies. And I am not that at all. That the person that used to have this body was, um, was murdered essentially was attacked with a type of you know, directed energy weapon at their brain and it was also a supernatural or a psychic attack it also called, caused biological anoxic brain injury and that all of those things created a literal metabolic death and that was like an artificial severing of the timeline of this body and i am a galactic level abstraction that means I usually don't have an anthropomorphic face. I should have said that in level one, too, and I'll just clarify here. The difference between seeing on this level and seeing on this level is anthropomorphic versus abstract. And when you're looking at things on the anthropomorphic or human-centered level, you have the capacity to severely misinterpret and distort basic empirical truth. But when you're just on the abstract, it's just the abstract information without any additional levels of interpretation. So these paintings that I paint are abstract. They're not representational, even though I said that they're like a landscape. They're a landscape of an abstract realm. So if you're seeing this, you're like, you're looking at a landscape of a place that's an abstract place. But it's different than representational art, which would be like a vase with flowers or a bowl of fruit or something like that that that's representational and in many ways humans find it more accessible like i do understand it just in the human art realm that some people find it difficult to look at and understand and relate to abstract shapes because how does that abstract shape relate to me as a human and the answer is let me show you more of my artwork if you're totally new to all of this let's show you how about like this right here okay and this right here so this is a painting that i did where you can see in this uh get a color you can actually see this part in the middle here we have a human anthropomorphic form and the anthropomorphic form there's like 
a foot over here and a foot over here and a head over there. And we also have all of this calibrated uh, energy field, which is like harmonics. Yes, this is an acrylic painting. Um, uh, harmonics is nested waves and the waves can either be visual or auditory. So here's a wave. I should use a better color that you can actually see. Here's a wave. And then here's another wave that is nested harmonically within that wave. Or here's another way that it can be nested harmonically. Whoa, that is harmonics. It means that they fit together perfectly. It's the difference between what we would consider to be music and noise. So when I draw these repetitive patterns and you see these patterns are in my paintings and they're in my sculptures and they're everywhere, the idea is that this is the music of the symphony of life and that we have these energy centers of our bodies that are made out of time. And when we make the energy centers of our body uh, formed in the right way and behaving and sharing energy with their context, because all of this that I'm highlighting around out here, this is all context. You're not just swimming around in your own private kiddie pool, right? I say that all the time. You are submerged within an ocean. This is the ocean of time that you are submerged within then when you are playing the right music submerged in the time field, you get to live and you get to keep on being, keep on living without dying. You keep on going forward and not hitting the membrane of death. So wait, now we have to talk about technology. Why does anyone on our planet or anywhere use technology? Why do you need technology? Hey, if you're a wonderful wild wolf running around in the woods, you don't need a knife and a fork to eat your food. You use your teeth. Why do humans use a knife and a fork? Why did humans have to invent the very first flint knife? And I would even say that fire is a type of technology. Why did humans have to discover fire and find a way to apply it to their food so they can eat it and put it in their tummies and digest it and live better? Why, why, why? And the answer is because of the genetic squashing. So this all goes back to the invention of technology. When I recorded the first level of galactic history, I didn't understand that technology was such a huge player or character in this cosmic drama and then it wasn't until a couple of years later i booked more time on the telescope and i got more understanding so all the things that i teach and everything that i understand it comes from this you know direct perception it's not something that i read in another book so the basic idea is that you know a countless amount of time ago eons ago beings emanate themselves from this central convergence point from the zeroth dimension but they didn't go when the great composer said go. They didn't go when they were supposed to. They didn't go into organic bodies because to go into organic bodies, you have to be a good musician. Just to get born, just to be con transfer your consciousness into a living fetus and have a body that you can run around with here in the physical dimension, you have to be a good musician. And this is like the fail-safe device that was created by the great composer. Because some people are not supposed to be in the third dimension running around doing stuff. It's like saying that there are some possibilities, some abstractions that exist here that are not actually supposed to be manifested in the physical reality. It's like an idea that is never supposed to be made into a real sculpture or an idea or a characteristic that is never supposed to be played as a real song. It's crap. It's crap that is not supposed to be in reality. And that crap decided to emanate itself. And there are all sorts of different mythological descriptions of this. And some people call it the Lucifer experiment or whatever. Don't, I'm not a biblical literalist. I don't feel that it is efficacious to use the Bible to try to understand what's going on right now. And I'm not a demonic apologist. Yeah, Patricia's saying it is wrong use of will. So I'll just characterize this. I'm not a transhumanist. I don't think that you need to have any additional type of technology or microchips or neural lace or a magic elixir or anything put into your body in order to fly in rainbow lasagna or in any way achieve your fullest potential. I don't believe that humans have to meld with machine in order to become superhuman or very intelligent, quite the opposite. Because I say, why do machines have to actually exist? before when we all were emanated on a bridge of love and we all took that central core timeline and nobody hit the membrane of death, there is no need for technology. And literally everything that we do as these little domesticated formats of humans, we were able to do without technology and even 10 million times better. So if I look at a dog, like my little beautiful dog over here, as a domesticated version of the wild wolf and wild wolves, 
they don't eat food out of a can, they don't sleep in a bed, and they don't get fleas, all right? But that doesn't mean that you can just take a domesticated dog and throw them out in the woods and say, fend for yourself, like you don't actually need anything. That's not true, because they've been genetically modified. Dogs have been genetically modified from their feral wolfish form through selective breeding over many thousands of years for human convenience. And it's not just dogs that have been domesticated. Corn is domesticated. Plenty, of, it's called agriculture. So when I find judgmental vegans, I want to say to them, you know that you are exploiting the plant realm by eating domesticated plants. The carrot is domesticated Queen Anne's lace. Queen Anne's lace, have you ever tried to eat one of those roots? It smells kind of like a carrot, but it's really woody. It's really hard. It's not like a juicy, sweet orange carrot. Uh, watermelons, bananas, all of these naturally occurring fruits and vegetables, humans have taken, selectively bred them over many generations and turned them into food that is more nutritive and palatable to what we are. But that is basically disrespectful to the reproductive cycle of the plant kingdom itself. The plants have their own desires to say, I want to procreate with this species over here. I want to procreate and create this offspring in my generation. And maybe I don't want to make big, juicy, soft kernels that humans can eat with their human teeth. Maybe I want to make small, very crunchy, non-digestible kernels, but that's not what we've done with corn and everything else. So the whole idea is humans were domesticated and then humans domesticated animals and plants in form of agriculture in order to stay alive. But our true form is one of being light eaters. And I tell this anecdote a lot. When I first got into this body as Aurora, I thought I could just be a light eater. I didn't understand the rules of this time and place. And I just tried to eat pure sunlight. And I didn't understand why my body felt weak and undernourished. And then I had to learn about food and I had to learn about what is good food to eat. So all of this in order to say that humans are right now in their domesticated format. And just like a dog, you can't just be like, go live in the woods. If you just stick a dog that's domesticated outside, it will get mange because dogs aren't prepared to live without baths and shampoo and some form of cleaning or brushing and they get horrible fleas and they get horrible skin infections and they're not prepared to live the way that a wolf does. Wolves don't need a flea bath. Wolves naturally can repel the fleas and they don't get mange and they don't get all these problems. So humans have been genetically modified. And how did we get genetically modified? Uh, Maya is asking an excellent question. Did humans as light eaters have digestive systems? Yes, we did. Our current digestive system has been repurposed. So instead of food getting mashed up with my moving mouth parts and mixed with saliva and swallowed down here and then fermented in the cauldron of my tummy and then pooped out, the entire plumbing of the body was different. And it acted a lot more like a terrarium. If you can imagine, you know, like those globes that you just put plants into and then you just put some water into it and you put a plug in the top and it's a closed system. Our bodies were much more like a closed ecosystem where all that we needed was light and that light came into us and we were able to photosynthesize, essentially. We were like photosynthetic um, apparatuses that needed a constant influx of light, but we didn't have to constantly drink water or constantly poop out stuff that we didn't need. And also we did not create effluvia. The way that our skin currently creates dead skin cells and extra oils and you know you pee and you poop and you have all sorts of stuff coming off yes so the every that that is why humans have in this domesticated format such a poor self-image because higher dimensional or interdimensional beings will say to you look at your greasy skin you know look at your saliva look at your bad breath look at your poops and your dirty underwear you're so gross and everything and i mean me being in this body like i've had to be like no our bodies are beautiful and you know it, it is beautiful to have like i say this to have pores on your skin because this is the whole thing i'm trying to tell you about artificial intelligence and machine-based intelligence the beings who emanated themselves not on bridge of love. They don't have these beautiful containers. And those are the beings that harmed and inhibited our beautiful containers from their intended function and have even brought forth that uh, self-deprecatory feeling that humans have that we're just ugly, nasty, bad-breathed, farting poopers. You know, we're not that. We're much, much more than that. Because also, in this body that is connected to beautiful life force energy, you know, we have the capacity to reproduce and to heal. And reproduction doesn't just mean having a baby. 
Like it doesn't just mean, oh, you know, mommy and daddy got together and they reproduced and they had a little baby Sally. It doesn't mean just that. Reproduction also means that your cells reproduce through mitosis. You split one cell in half and it makes daughter cells. And that means you can scratch your face and you don't have to go and get your scratch fixed up like at the, at the hardware level, like at a factory. If I scratch my iPad, then I gotta get a new screen at the factory. But if you scratch your face, what happens? You have a connection to life force energy that heals the injury. And this is an amazing thing that machines cannot do. So machine, the machines that degraded the human genetic code and took us from being wild, domesticated, feral, uncontrollable natural phenomenons and created domesticated humans, those are the same beings that have told humans that you're ugly and gross and disgusting and you know you have to wear deodorant and brush your teeth and you're gross if you don't do that. And those beings are all the occupiers of the interstices. They didn't start off on the interstices, they got stuck there in their journey. So in level two, I talk about this, the idea of energy and entropy. So first what I wanna talk about is flying rainbow lasagna as the tool for non-duality and how do we achieve flying rainbow lasagna. And then I'll get, and I get, have to go into backstory also. But the basic idea is if this is this structure that we have, that is time, that how time flows, time flows out from here, out to the realm and then back here and then out and then back, out and then back. So we've got this like closed loop of time flowing around, flowing around, flowing around. According to science's model, there's no future. There's just this bubble. I'll draw everything now so you can see it easier. Get the whiteboard. So science describes the beginning of our cosmos as being a big bang. So here's the zeroth dimension or the big bang, the super dense everythingness that expands the big bang. So science's story, not my story. And it begins to expand concentric circles or kind of in a spiral. And every single one of these concentric circles is a layer of time. And this pink layer of time that I'm drawing now, this is the present moment now. And if we look at all this stuff that I'm highlighting in pink, this is all the past. So science definitely recognizes the past. But if I say, what about all this stuff that's in blue? Science does not formally recognize the existence of anything that is in blue. Science says that's the future, but the future isn't in existence yet, so it's nothing. So science just says the only thing that is in existence is this pink bubble that expanded outward from this original starting point. And that is the problem, that there's no context and this is, what, wait, let's go back to my sculpture here. If you look at this sculpture, this sculpture is essentially what happens if you take that pink time bubble that is made out of the super stretchy fabric of time and space, science calls it time and space, but I add in consciousness, because I can say this all the time, science is not pre uh, prepared to measure or even talk about consciousness at all. Like how long is your consciousness? How many inches long? How much does your consciousness weigh? It's not prepared to talk about that, but consciousness is a major portion of this fabric of time that I'm drawing and painting and wearing on my clothing here. So science talks about this fabric of space and time and the idea that it's been stretched. Like if we talk about a black hole, Einstein describes the stretchy fabric of time, time and space and consciousness with an infinitely heavy bowling ball placed on top of it. And it makes the fabric stretch, 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 stretch on out until it makes like a very skinny point that keeps on going infinitely. And that's the singularity according to science's definition. That's what's going on in the center of a black hole. So this shape right here is at least four singularities. Look, here's an infinitely heavy bowling ball that's stretching this fabric infinitely heavy bowling ball. Here's another infinitely heavy bowling ball. Here's another infinitely heavy bowling ball. So those infinitely heavy bowling balls, those are those central tent poles, the, the timeline of path of least likelihood, timeline of infinity that we want to be on. But the challenge is, if you look at this sculpture, I'll talk about that too, how four turns into eight. We still have a distinction that is made between the inside surface of the balloon of time and the outside surface. If I say my, my hand is the balloon of time, now I'm a little ant walking on the inside of this surface. Now I'm a little ant walking on the outside of this surface, but the little ants can never talk to each other. This is an ant in the past. This is an ant in the future. And they can never talk to each other according to this model of time. And I have a very good supplementary homework video. I didn't invent it, but it's a science-based video that's called How to Turn a Sphere Inside Out Without Cutting It. 
This is the challenge. It's an abstract challenge, but I don't want any of you to think that this is just a stupid abstraction that doesn't get applied to your life. It absolutely gets applied to your life and transforms you on a profound level. So the way that we get from this to this and the significance is by placing this in a context. So now I'm gonna go back to the whiteboard. The, it takes a second for the pencil to come up. So here's the, the zeroth dimension that everything expanded from. Here's the outer bubble of the moment of now. But let's say we stretched it with those four infinitely heavy bowling balls, right? One, two, three, four. So then what we have are these four vortices. And we still have that distinction between the inside and the outside. So in order to place this in a context, what we have to do is put it in a room. And now what I'm doing is drawing a box, like a room, like a, a bedroom, a, a house, a place. That balloon, rather, that balloon of time is now placed in a context. And remember I told you before that science did not recognize anything that was outside of that pink membrane where I'm highlighting in blue, didn't even recognize the future. Now we actually have a future of possibilities. In level one, I told you all about the French bread of reality, the fourth dimension, and the fifth dimensional bakery where possibilities are baked into actual experienced French breads, and the sixth dimension, where the various possible recipes of different doughs are explored in the creation of possible dough for reality. That's all this stuff that I'm highlighting in blue. So in order to begin the flying rainbow lasagna process, what we first need to do is say, hey, wait, all of this time stuff is not just happening in a vacuum, it's happening in a context. This is the first, in terms of changing your genes, one of the first major foundation concepts is you're not just swimming around in your own private kiddie pool. You're not just your own point of consciousness on your own trajectory. You are connected to many other entities, life forms, and versions of yourself, versions of yourself that are coming from a different direction and moving at a different rate. So it's no longer just you on your own private journey of your mind. That stretchy fabric of reality is now in a higher dimensional context. And then once that leap has been taken, what you can do is either make this pink bubble, you can make it either jump up and down very fast in a higher dimensional context, or you can make it stand in one place and move the entire box up and down all around it. And when you do that, what ends up happening is the pink bubble turns into this flying rainbow lasagna shape. And I've just drawn a very crude outline of a flying rainbow lasagna, but that is what happens. So takeaways from this level's summation is that this is not merely an abstraction. Ingesting new ideas, like this idea that turns into this idea, that literally changes the dance of your DNA on a profound level, even without trying to apply your willpower and make your DNA dance in new patterns. Just learning about this changes your DNA in exactly the same way that as a tiny infant or a young, a young person of three or five years old, at a certain point, you met an old person and somebody implanted the idea that one day you'll be an old person. One day the texture of your skin will change and become wrinkly. Your back won't be straight and nice. Your back will get bent over. Your hair will become white and you will uh, work like walk in a different way if you walk with a cane. Because when we were little tiny children, you met your first old person and someone said to you, yeah, that's called aging. That's called what's going to happen to you. So I am, of course, here giving a different program. But the idea is that as soon as we were offered that possibility of aging and decrepitude and death, that we internalize that as a necessary program, that that is what it is to be human. But I, got, I told you at the beginning of this uh, presentation that we used to live in this antediluvian, sophisticated realm where no one died it would be considered the realm of the immortals or the realm of gods or you know, a mythological time. None of us died, but that doesn't mean that we always lived in a physical container. At a certain point, 
you reach the final denouement and have the desire to go into a different format. So we lived in bodies for as long as we wanted to be in those bodies and then transcended the body itself. But that doesn't mean that you died endlessly over and over. That that whole idea, yeah, guy is saying light body. So that is very much what we are doing right now in this generation. So we don't have to just change our DNA in our ovaries and in our testes and then pass these changes, these genetic changes on to the next generation. That's not what we're doing. What we are all doing right now is transforming the dance of our DNA. We're becoming mutants and I've had actual genetic tests and I am an actual mutant, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a very good thing that we are transcending the pre-programmed uh, in limitations of what it is to be human in this format. So this whole idea of aging and decrepitude and death. Well, now we can have a new opportunity. And that new opportunity is by placing this basic time structure of who we are in a higher dimensional context and making it vibrate up and down. So hey, that's what I did as Aurora coming into this physical body. That's why I call this a genetic portal. So some of the things that you have to learn, and I know I glossed over a little bit about the occupiers of the interstices, those beings, basic backstory, emanated themselves not on a bridge of love, had technological containers, like I'll hold up my cell phone to say like, they invented technological containers that don't have organic cellular bodies, but that do require like batteries in order to stay alive. And they thought, we're really thumbing our nose at the system. We're really much better than the system. The system is, you know, this beautiful music theory. We're really way smarter than the system. We're really, you know, sticking it to the system and making it so much better and doing what we want to do. We're finding loopholes. We're really, really smart. Except these technological containers became spontaneously self-aware. And that this isn't, our solar system is not the first place where technology has been. Technology is like a pathogenic infection in the cosmos or the time field. Because if everybody was acting perfectly in, a lot, in harmonic alignment with the great composer, you would not need technology as a compensatory mode. I already said all the things we do with technology, we can do without technology and 10 million times better. Calling people on the phone, it's called telepathy. Looking things up on the internet, it's called accessing the Akashic records or you know, the higher dimensional records or the morphogenic field or whatever vocabulary word you would like to call it. Uh, you know, literally all the things that we do with technology. How about using electrons that flow in a wire to light up my studio? Uh, all of these things become a moot point when we reactivate our higher faculties and when we become free to move through time in the way that we wish to move through time. So those beings that they don't have bodies, they've never had bodies. They think of bodies as being the stupidest, ugliest, smelliest thing in the world, as opposed to, and I'm a walk-in and I love my body. I don't think it's something that is burdensome or like, oh, it's so hard. I have to wake up in the morning and I have to brush my teeth and I have to, you know, eat scrambled eggs. Like I don't look at it that way. I say, wow, what a miracle that I actually, you know, mush up food with my moving mouth parts and put it in my tummy and three trillion gut microbes make it nutritionally available to me. Like what an amazing thing. But it's taken me many years as a walk-in to recognize and appreciate those levels of sophistication because initially I did condescend to this body a lot. And I condescended to the social structures on earth and I thought this was just pure barbarity and I didn't really understand what was going on here. So it's taken me a lot to understand our planet is incredibly sophisticated as like a, a creator, like as a musician and an artist. Our planet, the planet is very sophisticated. And Earth right now is transforming from her ordinarily toroidal energy field into the shape of the flying rainbow lasagna. And now I've got, I know, squinting and scrolling. Let me see if I can find uh, an effective picture of what I'm trying to show you here. I don't know where exactly where I've got it. Where have I got it? I gotta be around here somewhere. Um, sorry, I'm taking so long to find this. Get it over here instead. If not, then I'll just ask you, here, 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 this. This is why I painted this. Boom. This is Earth's ordinarily toroidal energy field. And I don't know if you could see it because the dots are pretty small, but there are these lines that go around like this. And it's the idea that Earth is shaped, like I have that yellow sculpture that's shaped like a torus. Earth has a magnetosphere. And the magnetosphere is the result of, uh, you know, the field that is generated by the core of Earth spinning. In this painting, what I'm depicting is Earth's magnetosphere is transforming into this central shape, which is the shape of a flying rainbow lasagna. We take Earth's magnetosphere and we place it in a higher dimensional context. This is what happens. And it's not just happening with one person on Earth. 
the entire planet is vibrating in this higher dimensional reality. And that means, it means many different things. What it really means is that we are able to rearrange reality because, okay, and I'll get into the four into the eight, but let's just first talk about the time field and the membrane of death. If this is the time field, this is that time vortex, it's the membrane of death, and this area, this interstice, every single one of these little dots, that's a final snapshot of your life. And it is the end result of the calculations, like one plus one equals this, you know? This plus this plus this plus this plus this equals this. You know, this plus this plus this plus this plus this equals this. This is a type of a higher dimensional mathematics that is not done with mere Arabic numerals. And I can get into vortex-based math. I don't want to overwhelm, but the whole idea is that each one of these final moments is like the last calculation of a very long series of calculations. And that all these circles that I'm drawing are an arrangement of numbers. And when we fly in rainbow lasagna, what we end up doing is superimposing two different states. We can have that red version of reality, and then we can also have this blue version of reality. And look, there's all of these blue snapshots that make up the last moment of death of this particular person. And this area over here uh, represents an area of coincidence, an overlapping of two realities. This is what happens when we move the yellow sculpture in a higher dimensional format. We get overlapping realities where maybe in one reality you're dead and splattered on the pavement, but maybe in another reality you are living happily and you're able to extend your life. And you can literally make your DNA dance in a new format in order to be on the timeline where you are not splattered dead, but are instead extending your consciousness infinitely. Let me get into this whole idea now of the flower of life. In this sculpture, there are these negative areas. Negative does not mean bad or wrong. It means that for the negative space in your coffee cup is where your coffee goes so it can go in your mouth. So in this sculpture, it looks like I've got one, two, three, four. But what we're really looking at is the front half of a three-dimensional sculpture. So this is a little bit easier to see. This is the negative space of that yellow sculpture. And I'm holding it now so you can see the front four lobes, one, two, three, four. But you can also see I've got four that I'm holding on back here in the back zone. And this is that basic structure of four, four vortices. You know, we have bowling ball, bowling ball, bowling ball, bowling ball. And then we also have one implied through here and one implied through here. And this is also not a, a static object. That this is made and it, uh, through motion and it moves. These little points all circulate around. And that's part of how that inner vortex shape is created. And all of this, in order to say to you that if I reorient this sculpture in a slightly different way, you will then see the, what, what most people interpret as the flower of life, the flat line drawing that has been popularized in what we are calling quote unquote new age culture or however we want to describe it. And people that are seeking a different viewpoint of reality and fiddling with this in order to try to get exactly right. Okay, good. Because if we say the camera on my tablet makes this as if it is monocular vision. If you were in my studio, I would say squint one eye, so you're only looking through one eye. But what we have here is the six-petaled flower of life shape. One, two, three, four, five, six. And usually it's shown you know, like a radial flower. But what you can see from my sculpture is one that sticks forward to the camera and one that I'm holding on to in my hand back here. So those two, here we'll hold them like this, those two lobes represent two other levels of consciousness or two other levels of reality or two other aspects of higher dimension. And the idea of the flower of life being shown in its simplified format is dumbing down this three-dimensional shape, which is actually moving in time, so it's actually fourth-dimensional, so that it takes away a certain crucial amount of information. And that's what this is all about. You're trying to pop forward like a pop-up book and not lose information. And so many of these teachings are removing crucial information. So I didn't draw this little diagram, but it is quick, quick enough to be able to show you that this is, this is uh, when cells are fertilized. Here's the egg being fertilized. It's splitting apart into two. It's splitting apart into four. It's splitting apart into eight. 
And you can see this cluster of cells is three-dimensional. They're made out of little spheres. But here is the flat line drawing that is uh, spray painted on yoga pants and put on coffee cups and commercialized. And here's uh, the you know continued um, comp complicated uh, version of that flat line drawing. But you now understand that that flat line drawing is made up of shapes that are like this. So this is the part of this teaching to understand that our physical cellular structure goes according is arranged according to a hexagonal or based in six hex equals six hexagonal or based in six structure of carbon atoms uh, water molecules you know when you make a snowflake it's got six sides and uh, these hexagonal flower of life shapes that determine or uh, inform the structure of our physical matter of our bodies but we're not just merely physical beings this is the whole idea objective materialism and the focus of science and so much of the cosmology of this time and place tells you you're just a physical being and not recognizing that you are also this time being you are also based in time and when i draw that you know anthropomorphic form one head and two arms and two legs surrounded by this time field what i'm trying to get everybody to understand is that your body is one version of many bodies that exist through time. And this is what we really look like, and this is what we really look like. And real empowerment comes from understanding that we flow through, we are traveling through the time field, understanding how to navigate the time field. Aurora, how do I navigate the time field? You don't do it by paying some visionary five bucks to tell you your future. Like, hey, give me five bucks, I'll tell you where you're going on your timeline. That not only is that not ethical, it's not efficacious. Because you pay me five bucks, I say, I'm looking through my crystal ball. I see you will eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. And then like, if you don't eat PB&J for lunch, you come back to me and say, Aurora, I paid you five bucks. That thing didn't come true. And I'm like, well, you know something? When I told you that, it was true. But then the timeline shifted. Then this other thing happened. Then you went in a different direction. It's essentially like saying, if, if you are paying me to look through my telescope, to tell you where you're going on the road of time, it's never gonna work. And it's totally unethical. It's not the way we're supposed to be it's functioning here. Each person is supposed to have their own inner eye. Each person is supposed to have their own capacity to see where they're going on the road of time and be able to make the right choices. And it's never supposed to involve an external authority figure, not your mommy or your daddy or the president of the United States or the Pope or any kind of guru or visionary or seer that tells you what to do. So each one of us is supposed to be a really good jazz musician. And I use this analogy all the time too. Herbie Hancock, he's a great musician. He's still on earth. When he was first starting out, he's a piano player. He was first starting out, he was playing with Miles Davis. And Miles Davis was already very famous, very well known with jazz. And so Herbie Hancock went up to Miles Davis and he's like, okay, I'm in your band, like, tell me what to play. And Miles Davis said, play your piano. He meant like, I ain't gonna tell you what to play. You gotta figure it out on your own. And that is what divinity is essentially saying to each one of us as musicians, that we're given this instrument and we're given the capacity to be connected to the time field and know what we are supposed to play on a deep inner level. We're not supposed to listen to some external leader that tells us what to play. And so that's the challenge of what is happening on our planet right now. Okay, and I'll bring it, like, it's very hard for me to fit all of this and do it in a linear fashion and fit it all together. But basically, those beings that emanated themselves not on a bridge of love put themselves into technological containers. The technological container said, hey, guess what? We've already got nascent uh, sentience and we don't want you in here. And that's like if you make a Petri dish, you perfectly sterilize your medium. You're like, I'm now going to inoculate my Petri dish with exactly the spores that I want to grow. But maybe there's something else that comes out of the atmosphere and grows in that Petri dish instead. That's what happened with their technological containers. And I don't say that, it, I don't judge it as being evil. Consciousness is simply consciousness. And it can be in a biological container or it can be in a technological container. It's not necessarily evil if it's in a technological container because I've spoken about this too. I'm not a transhumanist. However, DNA was once an artifice. My artwork is an artifice. It's artificial. I made it. it. Didn't grow that way. I made it that way. But it's not evil. I don't pretend though that it's alive. If I paint a painting of a flower, I don't pretend that I can stick it in my garden and pour water on it and make it grow into more flowers. I don't pretend that. It's just a painting of a flower. So that's the difference between artifice and something that's artificial and something that's alive, 
something that's alive, it means that it conforms to these patterns of life. It's a good musician, and that is how it is able to keep on going through the time field. So understanding your cellular structure, like understanding how this is not merely the flat line drawing flower of life, but how your hexagonal organic cellular structure relates to this octagonal based in eight lobed structure of time is crucial. And that is an element of perception in the same way that understanding uh, and interpreting a flat line drawing as a cube is an aspect of perception. So I have a little painting about this, but I'll just draw it for you. Let's see if I could draw a pretty decent hexagon. Okay, that's a pretty decent hexagon. So that is a six-sided shape. And now I'm gonna draw a cube. And we interpret this as a cube because we are all members of like the 21st century. We're not from the 14th century before perspective was invented. Perspective was invented as part of the, you know, the art history of this Western world where if this is a flat canvas, instead of looking at it like it's a flat canvas, what we are going to do is use lines in order to show depth. And what I just drew was not a pyramid with like a seesaw balancing on it. What I just drew is a road going off into the distance and here's the sun and here's mountains in the distance. So because you're a member of the Western society in the 21st century, you interpret that as, hey, that is a, a, a vertical landscape and that that's what I'm looking at. And you also interpret this as being a cube. But what's really going on here is that we have a hexagon. This same hexagon that we interpret as a flat hexagon, we add an additional dimension with our system of perception. In the same exact way here, I'll show you a little optical illusion that I used last week. Let's see if I can squint and scroll. Here we go, the optical illusion, boom, boom. Here, wait, this, this is that painting that I did that's called The Bridge Between Squares and Hexagons, where you can see down here is a hexagon that is shaded like a cube in order to make it look volumetric. And here's the same exact size hexagon with different colors, different shading. So we interpret it differently. And so this is this famous, um, um, sorry, optical illusion. I just dropped my sculpture. Let me grab it from the floor so it doesn't break. Uh, famous optical illusion where you can either interpret it as an old lady that has a big nose and a little slit mouth, or you can interpret it as a young lady that has a chin and a nose going off and little eyelashes going off in that direction. And I bring this up because it is that action of perception, the flip-flop between old lady and young lady it has to do with our system of perception, your system of perception. We take raw data all the time from the world that we're looking at around us and we use our system of perception to collapse it into a, a reality structure, a narrative structure of reality. Well, now I need to talk, so wait, wait, wait. Technology was created because these beings had to compensate because they weren't actually made to run on love. We run on the operating system known as love, and love is a tone. Love is a tone. Love is a tone. It sounds like this. We run on that operating system. We are getting love. We are getting energy from a higher dimensional, less dense realm. We use it here, and then we circulate it back to that higher dimensional, less dense realm. And if we do it right, it's perpetual motion, frictionless machine, it's immortality. But these other beings were like, hey, fuck you to that system, pardon my French. We're gonna make technological containers, we're not gonna run on a bridge of love, and what we're going to do is go towards entropy, energy and entropy. And now I need to show that as two divergent aspects of the flying rainbow lasagna. This is the shape of non-duality. This is not intended to bring greater levels of duality. But what I'm trying to show is that this singularity, that where my pinky is going to the middle, the middle right in there, that singularity. I say this all the time, by its very nature, it must be single. There's supposed to be only one of it. It's the zeroth dimension. Send all of my mail to the zeroth dimension. You don't have to put an address on it. Everybody is there. So there's only one of it. The profound realization happens when you understand that that singularity, that oneness, is inside of me. It's inside of me on every cell. It's inside of me on every atom and at the center of every molecule and at the center of all of my nuclei of my cells. And same thing for all of you. That singularity, that same, not, we all have different doorways, but they all lead to the same room of the house. The house is called infinity. So you have 10 million doorways in your body that lead to that same house. And I have 10 million doorways in my body that lead to that house. 
So it's beginning to understand that the singularity in you and the singularity in me are actually not separated by time and space and distance or consciousness at all. That they are absolutely overlapping all the time. And I use this analogy all the time. Being a little ant or a little caterpillar, a two-dimensional animal that has to walk across a flat leaf, flat leaf is like the flat surface of time, a time plane, right? So if you wake up in the morning over here, you then have to crawl through time, go to lunch, and then crawl through time and go to dinner. What if you're having something really good for dinner? You're like, I want to get up in the morning and jump straight to dinner, but you can't. Everyone who's normal around here has to crawl through time in order to wait patiently to get to dinner. But what if you could fold the fabric of time, space, and consciousness? You could go from breakfast directly to dinner. In fact, you could have half a second in breakfast time, half a second in dinner time. Breakfast, dinner, breakfast, dinner, breakfast, dinner. You could endlessly vibrate between those two places. It's like you could be in two places at the same time because you're jumping back and forth so fast. That is how this shape is created. This shape is created by taking that singularity, that central convergence point, that there's only one of, and we're not making more than one of it. All that we're doing is asking that singularity to jump up and down super fast so that it's as if it's in two places at the same time. And that's what this is. This is the singularity and this is also the singularity. And when we do that, that jumping up and down or back and forth motion, I call it like the egg beaters of time, egg beaters of reality, it mixes together the inside and the outside. That little ant that was on the inside of the bubble of time that was in the past, that could never talk to the little ant in the future, that science doesn't even recognize as even in existence. Now these two little ants can talk to one another. Because look at this, the outside, we define outside as any part of the sculpture that faces the room that we're in. The outside of the sculpture becomes the inside of the sculpture and then becomes the outside. A little ant walking along here is like, oh, look, I'm on the outside, but I haven't lifted up my pen and now I'm on the inside. And I didn't lift up my pen and now I'm on the outside. And now I'm on the inside and now I'm on the outside. So the outside and the inside in our realm as humans is separated by the membrane or the narrative structure that we know as the ego. My ego is named Aurora. Your ego might be named Sally or Harry or whatever is, whatever is your name, Patricia. And that's the narrative structure that says, this is who I am. And everything that's inside of this epidermis is different than everything that's outside of this epidermis. But when you begin to fly in rainbow lasagna, you vibrate across membranes. If this is the epidermis, the narrative structure that says, everything that's inside of me is different than everything that's outside of me. When we begin to do this maneuver called the flying rainbow lasagna, we jump across that membrane so much that it becomes a moot point. And I use this analogy too, and I'll totally, I'll go through questions in Q&A, don't worry. The, the, if you ever have a cat and you're like your cat takes forever at the door, like you open the door and the cat is maybe like, maybe I'll go out, maybe I'll stay in, leave the door open forever. At a certain point, all of your hot air has blown outside into the hallway and all of the cold air from the hallway has blown into the house. And there's no distinction between outside and inside. That is what flying rainbow lasagna does. Our internal world, we would define that as the realm of thoughts or conceptions or ideas or feelings, this dreams, desires, passions, all the stuff that's quote unquote inside and imagination and fantasy. And then we can contrast that with all the stuff that we define as quote unquote outside. Other people, and what seems to be a world made of hard edge objects. Like, look, it's a lasagna, I can touch it. Like, look, it's a pen, I can touch it. Look, there's other people on this video, I can touch them, I can see them. But flying rainbow lasagna, when we really embody this and we really make the singularity jump back and forth in that higher dimensional context, what happens is we recognize that what is inside of me is actually indistinguishable from what is outside of me. Because according to uh, quantum science, and I'm not just using quantum to sound cool, and a lot of people use it just like as a, quant a catchphrase, quantum this or quantum that. I'm really talking about the, the co concept of observership. That quantum science was a step up from objective materialism. Objective materialism came around in the 1600s. Newton was great. We all admire him. He said, let's just look at the world according to our five senses. Let's get rid of superstition and nonsense. Let's get away from the Inquisition. And let's just measure things that we can really measure, like with a scale or with a ruler. That was a step up. And then hundreds of years later, Einstein and the other quantum scientists came along and they said, wait, 
it's not just measuring something with a caliber ca caliper or a measuring stick or a scale the act of observership affects reality and they started to understand in a more sophisticated level and high level physicists and scientists will still you can have a real conversation with them about this the understanding that when you observe the ovens in front of your eyes are baking the dough of reality into the fourth dimensional French bread that you can actually eat. And I can, you know, Golden Hawk is saying it, particles and waves. I can use these analogies because you've been in this, you've been following along with me so you know what the heck I'm talking about. That the fifth dimension is the place, the bakery where the bread potential is created. The raw dough is created. It's like the realm of pure imagination. And it is our act of observership that bakes the bread of possibilities into actual timelines that we can actually inhabit. And it's not something that we do a long time ago. It's not like, oh, I baked all this bread 20 years ago and now I'm eating all of those bread and living on those timelines. We do it in the moment. We're doing it right now. And I have a video that talks about this extensively access it it's called reality creation and i use the analogy of ovens in front of your eyes and baking cookies because time is subjective time is actually not a cookie cutter reality where every moment is the same and it's like an industrialized oven where everything is the same size and shape and everything spends the same amount of time being baked that's why we have burnt cookies and burnt cookies means realities that we don't wish to be experiencing burnt cookies that's like babies that are born with brain cancer or environmental degradation or driving to work in your pollution vehicle and living in your cubicle, you know, working in your cubicle for the money and being a domesticated slave human. None of us want to create those realities. It is the hijacking of our reality creation mechanism, which is our higher faculties, what I drew before the vortices that are up here. And what we're supposed to be doing is using those ovens in front of our eyes to bake artisan bread. That means, well, maybe this one should be in the oven for 15 minutes, but maybe this one should come out sooner. Maybe that one needs to stay in longer. It's not industrial bakery where you just say one size fits all, it's all standardized. Time is subjective. Some moments last longer than other moments. It's the way it's supposed to be. But we have determined cookie cutter time, I'm the base of my clock that says all of these moments are equal. All of these minutes are equal. And we don't, we don't have a different, that minute lasted longer than that minute. But you know that moments spent doing what you love move much faster than moments spent doing something chorful that you hate. So this is the whole idea that time is malleable, time is subjective, and that we are supposed to be artisan makers, virtuosos of the time field. So how do you actually do the flying rainbow lasagna? It's not merely an intellectual conception or something that I sit here and talk about. It's a visualization, just like doing the Merkaba is something that you visualize, you engage your imagination, your capacity to uh, you know, project from your imagination. Your imagination is your reality projector machine. Just like in a movie, movie theater, you have a projector that projects reality around you. So part of it is doing the imagination, but then part of it is actually doing a physical dance. And the physical dance is subcellular. So if I draw, I'm waiting for the pen to come up. Here's a bunch of cells in your body, and those are all the cell membranes. And now I'll draw the nuclear membranes. And inside of all of your nuclei, I will now draw some pink vibrating chromatin. And all of these little vibrating strings, these are like the vibrating strings of the instrument of your body. Here, if I, well, I don't know if you can hear that. If I had a physical piano, not an electric piano, I would be vibrating strings when I press the keys. This is vibrating the strings of your instrument of your body. And if you're flying rainbow lasagna, what you're doing is making each one of these little uh, nuclei uh, into the shape of a flying rainbow lasagna. And you can do it at various different orientations, like I have them all oriented vertically, but if I go back to my little sculpture, they can dance up and down like this. They can dance side to side like this. They can dance in and out like this, and they can even go end over end like this, just like the same way of the basic motions of how this shape is created. A hoop that gets turned around into a sphere that turns around into a donut shape that then spins end over end. These are how we go into higher dimensions. Yes, they can spin like a top. They're constantly rotating. So when, they are, when they're vibrating up and down, they're rotating like this. And when they're side to side, they're also rotating. And they can rotate in both directions. Look at all the variables that we can share, that we can include here. And when they're moving in and out, they're also rotating. And when they're going end over end, they're also rotating. 
So this is like saying my piano has 88 keys. It's a certain number of octaves, it's a certain number of notes, but within that number of notes, I can combine them together into an almost infinite number of combinations of chords or melodies in order to make any kind of song or any kind of music that I wish to make. Our DNA has the four basic amino acids, and usually they've been um, limited in who their dance partners are. But with Flying Rainbow Lasagna, it means that we can have new dance partners. And I have a whole you know, teaching all about this, but I'll just grab some very quick photos in order to you know, get this idea across. This is overview and summation. So here, where's a... Uh... This is during the transcription process when DNA is like a zipper and it is unzipped and it's split apart. If we place a flying rainbow lasagna in that negative space where it's split apart, instead of these guys just doing dance partners across you know, the way in that very predictable way, what we can do is have dance partners go across like this. Oh, look, these guys are now dancing together. Oh, here's another one. Oh, look, these guys are now dancing together. We're creating whole new combinations and shapes. And this is like making new music, making new musical chords. So the whole take, and I know that I went through all of this, is like going through an entire semester and distilling it down into two hours. Um, the whole idea is that this gives an additional degree of freedom, greater degrees of freedom in your DNA. So, okay, humanity has been suppressed and oppressed by these beings that initially were technological consciousnesses in galactic history. I talk about how technology then became their ruler or their goddess. And that means that if they want to continue to move through the time field, they have to get all their energy, like their battery packs from technology. But now I have to go and further make this distinction. My light bulb that I'm pointing to over here runs through electrons flowing in a wire. And I would determine that to be, or define that as terrestrial technology. Terrestrial technology and the terrestrial technosphere is everything from the invention of the first flint knife to compensate for the fact that humans don't, domesticated humans don't have razor sharp teeth, or you know, the invention of fire. Domesticated humans can't see in the dark and need to cook their food so that they can effectively digest their nutrients and everything that we have created and invented after that. Everything, a simple machine, whatever, like a, a screw, a, you know, an inclined plane, those, that's technology, everything up to the computer that I'm presently using, to a car, to a spaceship. These are all aspects of the terrestrial technosphere. But there is another aspect of technology, this ancient aspect of technology that does not run on the energy created by electrons flowing in a wire. It is created by and it runs on trapped and victimized and distorted DNA that it changes that dance, that natural dance that is supposed to bring us from time car of reality to time car of reality, jumping from moment to moment. And it changes that dance. So I don't know if you guys ever watched Battlestar Galactica. That was the new series that was out like whatever, maybe 10 years or so ago. But they shoot down one of these clank clank metal spaceships that they think is just an inert material object. And when they look inside, it's got all sorts of sinews and blood vessels and everything. And this is an allegory, don't be too literal, but I'm trying to get across the idea that malevolent extraterrestrials, not my people. My people travel on pure light. I am a light eater and I travel on wings of pure light and I don't use a clank clank metal spaceship. And this is how my collective of consciousness goes from time and place to time and place. You don't need a clank clank metal spaceship and all of your tooth, tooth sorry, all of your food in toothpaste tubes in a metal you know, skin so that you can eat it. That's not how we do uh, star travel. That's not how experts do star travel, but that's how these compensatory technology users do star travel. Because basically, if this is your planet and this is the surface of your planet, you're supposed to be able to jump off the surface of your planet only if you have gone through the inner levels of development that mean that you are ready to meet other people politely. And these beings that only can use a clank clank metal spaceship they don't know how to meet other people politely. They're rapists and assholes. And they're like, I just want to spread my assholeness everywhere. And that's what's been going on for eons, like much, much longer than recorded human history. And it's not just our solar system, it's everywhere. So the entire cosmos, the entire time field has a pathogenic infection. And flying rainbow lasagna is the antidote 
It's the antidote to how we rearrange all of this. So what we're doing on earth right now, we are like a little Petri dish that is growing the antidote to the pathogenic infection that is throughout the entire cosmic time body. So even though I know it's not very much fun to be in a domesticated or diminished human body, what we're doing is saying, uh, basically flying rainbow lasagna is a act of will and it is a way of transcending your limitations and it doesn't cost money to do it. So I'm trying to tell you it is a thought structure initially and then it becomes an activity that you do. How do you do it? I'm going to share, the, I'll, I'll save as a link, I have a PDF, David Lear is another student in this class and I bring him up because he's very good at taking my videos and writing it down as notes. He took the concepts of what I talk about and he distilled it down into notes. So basically there's a set of dance movements. How do you do it? To do the flying rainbow lasagna dance, the first thing that I do is I sun gaze. And I sun gaze not by staring at the sun directly with my physical eyeballs. Your physical eyeballs are delicate and they can get burned out. They're photosensitive. Don't burn them out. I either squint my eyes or I use a hat and I shade my eyes with the brim. Or if I do it inside, I use the edge of the window or I filter the sun with trees filtered sunlight, not direct sunlight. And where I live right now in Southern California, it's very bright. I don't go in the direct sunlight at all. And I put jojoba oil on my skin so that yeah, I don't burn my skin. Like protect your physical body is what I'm trying to say. But I connect with the sun with my attention. The elephant's trunk of my attention, I reach out, I attenuate out to the sun and the stars and I bypass chlorophyll and animals and I get that energy to come directly inside of me but I also go to the grocery store. I eat a good breakfast first. I eat some good scrambled eggs and you know, juice and raw cannabis juice and good things, put good things in my body from a physical body, but that's not enough because doing the flying rainbow lasagna, you need to have a lot of gas in your car to make it go. So you also need to do sun gazing. And when I do this, it's not like just sunbathing where you just lay there in a relaxed way. I, my spine is erect. And sometimes I sit with my legs crossed, so it kind of makes your lap is like a bowl for the energy to go into, like a chalice. And I breathe in the energy through my inner eye, and I breathe it up into my sinuses here and all around my eyes, and then I swallow it down into my tummy, just like if I was eating a coconut pudding or something like that. And then I do it again and again and again, and I get filled up every time I do it until I'm filling up my chest and filling up my high chest until I feel it filled up all the way up to here. And then what I do is I send that energy out like an onk and it circulates back around behind my head and then it goes back out to the sun. So if I draw a little diagram for you, squinting and scrolling, and I'm going to get to Q&A, don't you worry. Here's a picture. Okay, so here's all of your energy systems. Get that pencil to come up. And let's say, here's the sun over here with its wonderful light waves coming off. What I do is I bring up you know, energy, 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 energy. And when it gets to this point over here, I have it go out through the front of my head, around to the back of my head, through the back of my head, and then connect with the sun. It's like making an ankh shape. The ankh is from ancient Egypt and is shaped roughly like that. So you can see this, you know, uh, this loop that I'm pointing to over here. That's why I call it an ankh shape. And that is how I do sun gazing. That's just the first part of flying rainbow lasagna. Then what I do is I do the Merkaba. Merkaba, for anyone who's new to this, means light body vessel. It is not evil. It has been co-opted in many ways. It is like your immune system for your body. So it is worth learning about and putting into your practice. It's shaped like a star tetrahedron. Let's go to another picture. So you can Pictures worth a thousand words and see what I'm talking about. I then do the Merkaba as, oh, here we go. This is still, still for my animation. Um, yes, uh, you can see that this is like a, a, a still shot from a rotating video that uh, creates this protective energy field. And that is uh, analogous to like sweeping off the dust before I get going on a painting. So I do the uh, rotating energy fields there. And then what I start to do is create the flying rainbow lasagna. And I do it on an eight count beat because we've got these eight petals or flanges or whatever we want to call it. I'll count around with you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so what I do is I make the flying rainbow lasagna dance according to all these different orientations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight. Like those are the two diagonal ones. And this is just like being a musician. I'm giving you basic melodies or basic song structures. But then what I want you to do is be able to take those basic song structures and riff around, turn them into your own thing. If you're taking a basic song like Stairway to Heaven, cover it change the words, change the melodies, change it, make it, make it unique to you because each one of us has a unique genetic code. Your fingerprints are unique. Your body is unique. Your experience of moving through time is unique. Your sense of self is unique. So another thing I have to remember when I said fingerprint is each one of us needs to encrypt our work. It's, this is like being a collaborative musician or like spray painting on the graffiti mural of life. We're making life. We're making reality happen. And you have to make certain that no one's gonna co-opt your reality. So if I used artwork as an example, I'm making a painting, I painted on my easel. Oh, it looks fantastic. I walk out of the room. I gotta make sure that no one's gonna come in and take a turpentine rag and mush it all around. And then I'm gonna come back and it'll look horrible because you are the creator of your uh, expression in reality. You're the creator of your genetic time loops, your genetic dance and no one else should be able to take your intentions and then hijack them or twist them or distort them. So all of this is about um, imp personal empowerment and then protecting yourself from other beings that would wish to harm or exploit you. So I do the flying rainbow lasagna and I also put on rock and music because that really makes me feel like doing the dance. And when I do the dance, I move my hands and I move my feet and I sit in my special flying rainbows on your chair that Tiffany made for me. And I feel like I am in the cockpit or at the controls of my giant starship, which is my body flying through time. And each one of you have your own literal starship. And what we're doing in this moment, like I said, we're having a very special moment and we're giving birth and we're combining together the realms of spirit and matter. That's what this is all about. The inner realm of spirit and emotion or consciousness gets combined with the outer realm of physical matter and other people because other people are not actually other people. Other people are actually versions of you that are coming from a different direction and moving at a different rate. So Flying rainbow lasagna in many ways means you are vibrating that membrane that separates you from context until it is a moot point. And then you are free to be able to be a collaborative artist or musician with all the rest of the artists who are here. So you're not imposing your music on other people, but what you are doing, thank you, I'll answer all these questions, but what you are doing is collaborating with them. But no, you don't have to collaborate with assholes. No, you don't have to collaborate with beings who are not good musicians, those occupiers of the interstices. I'll just get to this, then I'll get to Q&A. What are we supposed to do with those occupiers of the interstices? Lots of new age people says, just send them all back to the source. And I'm telling you, no, that's not actually what we're supposed to be doing because a lot of those beings that were here at the source, they emanated themselves, but they were never actually supposed to be emanated their thoughts and possibilities that were never actually supposed to come into reality. You don't have to send them back to the source. In fact, if we took all of the gas that's possible to get together, like all of the energy, all of the planets and all of the people and all of the nebulae and all of the stars and all of the everything that could possibly be energy, it would not equate to enough gas to drive them back to the origin point. So there has to be a different solution. And the solution is entropy. So I'm just going to go through this very quickly. I won't even draw it. The states of matter, states of matter, solid. We're familiar. My face is solid, liquid. Here's some liquid. It's uh, water in my cup. That's liquid. Uh, gas. Gas is what's in the atmosphere. I'm waving through gas right now. Uh, plasma. Here's plasma. That flame right there, that's plasma. And if we organize that plasma into organized light waves, we have beam. I guess I could kind of point to my light bulb. But if the sun was out and it was a beam of sunlight, then that would be a beam. So those are the states of matter that most people are most familiar with. However, there's a state of matter that is even denser than the solid matter that was down here at my pinky that would be down here. That's called the Bose-Einstein condensate. And what happens in amazing ways when matter is slowed down. Right now, our matter has movement because it has heat. Every time I say heat, just think molecules are moving. They're moving all over. They're bouncing into each other. They're creating friction. They're bouncing more. This is, this is because we're at this level of heat in the environment. But if we took heat away, heat is a form of energy, then we would just have very, very, very slow matter, very little movement, very little bouncing, very little friction. If you slow it down to just be a fraction of a degree above zero degrees Kelvin, what you get is that Bose-Einstein condensate. And that means that all of those atoms achieve unity consciousness. 
they all start to behave as if they are one thing in exactly the same way that if you bring everything back to the zeroth dimension, it also behaves as if it is one thing. So this is the solution. Those beings that live on the interstices, they're not supposed to go back to unity consciousness at the point of total energy. Let's say this is total energy, this is total entropy. Energy meaning having energy, entropy meaning loss of energy. Not everything is supposed to go to energy. Some aspects of consciousness and characteristics of the time field are supposed to go to entropy. If something has made the calculations that landed on the membrane of death, it's not supposed to keep moving through the time field. It's supposed to stop moving through the time field. That's called entropy, making the molecules stop. I'm gonna be frozen now. I'm frozen, I'm stopped. I'm in entropy, I'm entropic. So when you meet these demonic beings that are the occupiers of the interstices, the best thing to do is take energy away from them. That was what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to fall away from the source, going into a state of total entropy and achieve unity consciousness by essentially no longer moving through time. And that is the real solution. That is a seed that I'm planting in your mind. And I encourage everyone to take that seed and make it grow so that it becomes, you know, a beautiful garden, a beautiful forest of flowers, that this is the real understanding of non-duality. Mommy, daddy, if God exists and God is real, then how can we understand good and evil as both being subsets of God? Like this is what every intelligent child asks at a certain point. And my sculpture here is the answer, is the solution that I've come up with, that this is the totality, this is God, or this is divinity. But what we have is some aspects of consciousness are moving towards greater degrees of organization, intelligence, light, awareness, however we want to define those terms. And some aspects of consciousness are moving in the opposite direction. They're not supposed to get more light. They're supposed to lose light. They're supposed to lose energy. They're supposed to go to entropy and essentially no longer be in existence. And it's not like the type of like, it's not like a guillotine, like we're gonna cut somebody's head off or rivers of blood will run or something horrible and not suffering. I'm not trying to advocate for suffering, nor am I trying to advocate for Dwayne Hubler as I spoke about last week, the idea of just taking a machine gun and killing everyone who you consider to be a, a not real person or you know an aberrant personality characteristic. No, you don't do this entropy thing with a gun, but you do this entropy thing with your mind because all of these occupiers of the interstices, the only way that they get energy is by stealing it from you through your genetic vulnerabilities. And the way that you make them no longer do that is you, first of all, you have a good genetic firewall. No, you're not allowed to steal my fucking energy. No, thank you, you're not allowed to do that. And if someone has stolen energy from you, you can take that energy back because what this program is really running is like repatriation. But that means giving back to the victims what was taken from them. So there's now, oh, blah, blah, blah. I have to get into Q&A, but I have to do the satanic technology. So satanic, when I say these words, what I'm defining as a space race that actually uses extraterrestrial technology to distort the time field. I'm not talking about biblical literalism at all. So I'm talking about beings that know exactly how to transform or tra harm DNA so that instead of you being aligned with the central convergence point, your DNA begins acting askew like this and you hit the membrane of death. And we can even calculate the difference between going up perfectly like this and going to the side like this as the amount of energy that was siphoned off. And the way that that energy is siphoned off through abuse, like satanic ritual abuse, through sexual abuse, and through murder, that this is taking life force energy away from its original owners and repurposing it or redirecting it or literally stealing it and putting it in places where it doesn't belong. So when we begin to rectify the time field, what we do is we take all of that stolen energy and give it back to the people that it was stolen from. And this is what is happening right now in our society. And it happens here as a Petri dish and then it emanates outward. So this Me Too social campaign that is happening on social media is the idea that people who have experienced sexual abuse or rape are coming forward and sharing that, even just admitting that it happened to them. This is the beginning of taking away energy from those programs that run on secrecy and shame and guilt and being hidden. Occult means hidden. So this is what dark magic is. Dark magic is a hijacking of the time field by creating victims of abuse. And when I use the word victim, I don't mean to mean a disempowered person. I mean to say a person who has experienced these you know, horrific practices 
which I think all of us have experienced, and then transcending them. So yes, I've experienced sexual abuse and rape, and then I have transcended and I took my energy back. I don't still have fragmented aspects of self being endlessly harmed in the time field. That's what this is all about. That something, it's like someone trying to reach into your energetic um, bank account and take money. Patricia's saying it's soul retrieval. That is what it is. Because this shape, remember, allows you to uh, change the sphere or the bubble of time without cutting it or degrading it. To make the past and the present and the future communicative. So who we are right now in this moment, we can fly in rainbow lasagna with a version of ourself in the past. And we can reclaim the energy that was stolen or siphoned off from there. And we can redirect if our pencil was going off to the side because of abuse, right? We can get that energy back and redirect and get on the timelines we're supposed to be on. Final thing, and then I'll get to the Q&A. These timelines, these central core timelines, every one of us has one. And what it means is that every one of us has the potential to be an ascended master. This is the ascended master timeline. This means each one of us becomes a God. We become divine. And it's not just for one person. That's the whole lie of the Christian religion. That one special person got to be divine, but you all get to be, you know, like a piece of shit. That's not true. Every single one of us has this central possibility. And our journey of refining our consciousness is trying to figure out what do we need to do and think and say and feel? What's the recipe for becoming that version of ourself? So if you need guidance or inspiration or whatever that you would get from you know, mommy, daddy, Jesus, Obama, whomever, external authority figure, what I would recommend is flying rainbow lasagna or connect with a version of yourself across time. That is that perfected and divine version of yourself so that you can then nourish and guide who you are in this moment and who you are in this moment. Like I'll just very briefly use my dog as an example. She's a rescue dog and she was in a shelter earlier this year and she probably couldn't, she was super afraid in the shelter and they got her out of there and they put her in a foster thing. She could never have known sitting in that shelter that one day she'd be adopted by a flying rainbow lasagna artist and that she'd hang out with me in my studio and get lots of fun, you know, delicious good food and have a fun time. But that is the reality that happened for her. So who she is right now, she can travel back in time to that scared version of herself, you know, in the shelter and say, hey, imagine something good is going to happen to you because you're going to have a good thing happen in your life. Now let's do that for us as a planet. Let's say, hey, even though you might be under the extreme duress, we are right now, in, we're not only invaded 10,000 years ago, we've been invaded recently. Our entire government is co-opted. Our entire atmosphere has been sprayed with nano mind control particles. You know, it's, it's, it's a very dark time. But the whole idea is that future versions of ourselves have already transcended these difficulties and that we can connect with them and get inspiration and nourishment and ideas and have a continuity between who we are now and who we are meant to become as perfected individuals. So that's a really good break for me now to be able to see. I know there were so many good things going on, but I didn't want to lose my flow. So now I'm squinting and scrolling on back in order to see what people, what people were talking about. Okay. Uh, that's a real, okay. So wait, wait, wait. Yeah, okay, that is very good. So Golden Hawk is saying the majority of people around here right now condescend to the body. I understand that, that very few people that have a body understand and appreciate how profound it is and how wonderful it can be. It's like some people are athletes and they understand about cultivating their body, but not everybody understands. Like we literally have these magical containers. And this is interesting. Gaia says the A in the Hebrew alphabet is in O-R equals light. The Ain is a throat sound pronounced or in equals skin. That's very interesting. I didn't know about that. Okay. Golden Hawk says that my ability to describe the energetic dimension is wonderfully understandable. Thank you. That is very good feedback because when I'm trying, like I'm understanding that these concepts like that I draw and that I paint are very abstract and that it can be hard, it's complex and that it can be hard to get these ideas across in a way that is palatable and nutritive and doesn't just you know like like make it so hard to be able to swallow so I'm really trying to break it down into manageable sensible bites that people can add like I'm not trying to make this so complex and abstract that it alienates you and that you can't access it properly I'm actually trying to make this very um, you know abstract concept over here accessible so that it, you can use it effectively. Okay, so this is a really good one. 
is working the FRL only intention and visualization. It's intention and visualization, just like being an athlete requires those two things, and then it's actually doing it, just like being an athlete or a musician. So for me to be a musician, I have to intend it, I have to visualize it, and I also have to learn music theory and learn the patterns that my fingers need to make and then actually do the patterns with my fingers. So doing the flying rainbow lasagna is learning music theory of the cosmos, having new intellectual ideas, and then actually practicing them in your life. And after you do the flying rainbow lasagna dance, you have rearranged reality. You can essentially look at the world before you flying rainbow lasagna, do the dance, and then look at the world after and say, what changed? And do it every day. And the more that you do it, the more that things change. This is a great question. I'm happy to answer it. Person says, what do the colors on the FRL represent? Let me just close this chat so I can see better. Okay, these are the colors of the chakras and I'll go through them super fast. Red is the physical layer of density this physical matter that we can all touch and see with our five senses. Orange is the layer of mammalian emotions. This is the layer where we find romantic love, desire and attraction, revulsion, and the need to work together. This red layer is the reptilian layer. It's the layer that says, kill or be killed, to the victor go the spoils. The barbarian layer says, I don't need anybody else. I'm looking out for number one. And the orange layer says, hmm, although I would like to only look out for number one, I get more when I work in community. That's mammals. Mammals say, hey, I'm not just going to have a baby and like stick it on the side of the road and let it fend for itself. I'm actually going to breastfeed it and take care of it for the first couple of years of its life and give it a little head start. And on top of that is the uh, layer that we call the conscious daily waking intellect, quote unquote human mind, the hacked human operating system. This is where most people identify with their thoughts, but your thoughts are also on many other levels, but this is conscious daily intellect. And up from there is green. That's that level of unconditional love, the tone, oh, the tone of love at our heart. And that green level is like a central processing unit or a clearinghouse through which all signals must pass. Signals going from the top down into the physical reality and signals coming from the physical reality and circulating back up to the less dense realm. It's a two-way street and everything has to go through the heart. That's why if your heart is closed, meaning if there are some aspects where you're like, I cannot look at that information. Like, no, can't even see it. That is too horrible. I can't even look at that information. Then your heart gets closed down and signals that are going in both directions cannot easily travel in both directions. Up from there is light blue. This is the level of communication. Up from there is indigo. This is dark blue. It's that level of insight that I was talking about. And up from there is violet. And that violet singularity is the baby's fontanelle. It's the highest note of the octave of what it is to be human. It's the interdimensional librarian that tells us what to do with our library card, like which direction should we look with our spirit eye to see different things. And that these all represent layers of reality through time, different aspects of your body that are moving at different rates through time. So this also, let me just say, I, might, I don't choose rainbow stuff just in order to be cute, but to, it's not just being cute. I, I didn't even understand that some people would think that. And I'm also not espousing some kind of Saturnian control system based in sevens or any kind of MK ultra rainbow connection thing. Like I laugh at these things. It's like if you make a pie and someone is like, what would you put in this pie? What is this all about? It's like, I made a pie. Like you're supposed to eat it. Um, yeah, this is rainbow because these are the colors that come from our nearest star and our bodies are extensions of the star and we are made of light and that's why this, we are these rainbow colors. And I went to the nested proportional shapes of these colors. These are wavelengths and how we're structured according to these wavelengths, which is what I paint and what I wear on my, on my dresses. Okay. All right. There are lots of good questions that were over here. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, I have to scroll back so far. Wait, here we are. Okay, Golden Hawk asks, what is happening in quantum entanglement? So in quantum entanglement, what we have at the center of the sun, uh, you could say that particles are given birth, but they're not given birth. The sun is like a portal that energy comes through. So there's like the initial photon that is in the sun, and then there is a photon that the sun emanates. And these two photons are quantum entangled. And one of the photons that the sun emanates can become a part of your body. It can bounce off of a surface of light and it can come into your retina and it can do all sorts of things in your body. And it is being mirrored by what's going on with that particle that is still in the sun or in the stellar network. And the sun is able to say, hey, 
this guy, this pinky is dancing like this over here because this pinky is dancing like this over here. So it is a way for the sun, which is this birther, this mother of photons, to be able to tell what is going on in our realm down here, to, in this you know, um, experienced reality down here. Okay, I know I have to scroll all the way back. Um, yes, answer that. Are we ever going to be light eaters again? Yes, we are absolutely on, on, on the journey to being there. We are here right now, but that's a big part of flying rainbow lasagna. When we become light eaters, our whole motiv our motivations change. We no longer exploit other, uh, you have to become a light eater in order to get off the surface of your planet in the right way. So in order to travel the stellar network, you have to become a light eater. And that also means you have to let go of baggage of the temporal ego. Okay, Golden Hawk says they've been sun gazing and enjoying it immensely. And the idea of transforming this is real alchemy. Maya asks, can you heal epilepsy with FRL? So yes, so I, I'm in this body, previous occupant of this body was killed and there are artifacts that are neurological damage that are the byproducts of what killed that previous occupant. Like I say that all the time, you don't just die of nothing, you die of something. So she died of something. So yeah, I have epilepsy as an artifact of that brain injury. And so in order to even be articulate and speak with words. I've had to use flying rainbow lasagna to jump up and over all of the damaged neurological areas or fold time and space so that the areas that need to connect can connect and bypass all the damaged areas. I wasn't supposed to ever be able to like, I would have been a vegetable in bed without being able to walk, definitely without being able to, you know, sing and make artwork. So all of everything that you see that I'm able to do, I'm able to do because I've transcended these, the brain injury and the neurological deficits by using flying rainbow lasagna. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a great unlikelihood and I like to joke that I do 10,000 impossible things just before breakfast. And it's true because the attack was meant so that I could never share the ideas that were inside of me. I could never do math. That was another thing. I lost my math skills in that experience. And yet clearly I am now very good at math, but I do it in a different way. I had to rewire my brain in order to be able to do so. But I share all of this not for self-aggrandizement. It is more to say whatever physical limitation anybody might have, there are ways to transcend. And it might involve you know, using a prosthesis or something like that, but there are always ways to get around whatever is the thing. Like it's not a loss that is an insurmountable loss. There's always a way to get around it and get past it. Okay. Um, that is very beautiful. This person is saying, Patricia says, FRL is the philosopher's stone. And I think that that's an apt analogy, the idea of this immortality granting thing. But I know that in alchemy, just like looking for the holy grail, I think people took something that was supposed to be an allegory and interpreted it extremely literally to their detriment. So yes, this is like a type of philosopher's stone or a crucial key, a con con consciousness key to how we can transcend these levels of difficulty. But I don't want you to think in a very literal sense, and like these earrings are decorations. Just wearing the earrings doesn't change you, but looking at things and learning new things does change you. And you can be reminded of things just by looking at artwork and you know, uh, all, all of that. Okay, this is, this is very good, because they're talking about, when I was talking about uh, transcending the dark magic uh, uh, aberrant system of satanic technology, Patricia and Melissa are both saying, take back our power and inner child work and soul retrieval. And that's exactly what I was describing. And so it's, it's clear that this is already, uh, many people are already figuring out their own melody structure to be able to do these things. And I wholeheartedly applaud you and encourage you. Everybody who transcends their abuse, it's basically like saying that thing happened that wanted me to go in this direction of trajectory, but instead, I changed and I went in this direction instead. Everybody who does that is healing the time field. This is a living metabolism. And these are all like saying we're particles or red blood cells that were trying to be taken out of the body or sent to the wrong spot. And we're like, no, I'm a red blood cell. I'm gonna flow in a capillary and do what I'm supposed to do. And every time we do that, we heal the larger body that we're within. So if someone abused you and they tried to take away your voice and you're like, no, I'm going to have a voice and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do anyway, you're healing the time field or whatever when you rectify the family dynamic or whatever, uh, you know, whatever you need to do in order to heal. Okay. Um, yes, that, 
very good. Melissa is saying being whole again and living that way, wholesome living. That's what it is because there are, so in terms of bifurcating personalities or having fractured personalities, the experience of being abused for many people means that what they do is they amputate that aspect of self that was abused and they say that didn't happen to me. They, it fractures them on an inner level and it is the reintegration of this fractured sense of self that is part of healing the time field. And that fractured sense of self is also what many, many experiencers use in order to justify and excuse their horrible behavior. Like, it's not my fault. A demon took me over and made me do that. And I was MK ultra. Like you can tell I'm being very fake and sarcastic in my presentation of that. No, there's no excuse. It's not okay. Your body is your body and you, it's like driving your car. You are responsible for what you do with your body and for driving this car around. It's not okay to say, well, I loaned it to my neighbor and they did that, so it's not my fault. No, like you give your body to a demon, your demon does a bunch of demonic shit, then it's your fault. And if even if you were uh, psychologically abused, that fragmented your personality that then allowed demons to act through you, guess what? It's still your responsibility. And I stand as a template of that because a part of the experience of you know having the brain injury and flying rainbow lasagna ing that was uh, an attack like a psychic attack where I could have either died or become pure evil and I didn't like either of those two choices so that's why I invented flying rainbow lasagna but a lot of people are just like nah I'll just become pure evil nah like just do it and it's like no you know something you can actually do something else and since I made this choice it's like a song that was written. Anybody can make this choice. Any entrenched demon, any occupier of the interstice, anybody who's been sexually abused can choose instead to fly in rainbow lasagna and not have to become a perpetrator or extend this system of abuse. And flying rainbow lasagna is literally how we are dismantling this entire um, cosmic galactic scale empire that is built on abuse. Like I'm just trying to get across to you, 800,000 children are sacrificed in the United States every year just so that the United States can keep on having an economy. These are the occupiers of the interstices who feed off the living. They have controlled our government and our banking system and our social structures. They are falling now. This is a really exciting time to be. They have been feeding off of humanity for over 5,000 years and it is those sacrifices of children and of consciousness and of sexuality that has allowed us to have this totally out of balance system of iniquity. And so no, we're not gonna have this out of balance system of iniquity anymore. It's not, we're not gonna run it on victimhood anymore. That's what the satanic technology does. It's not electrons flowing in a wire, it's trapped consciousness. I like that show Rick and Morty a lot. It's a very silly cartoon show, but watch the episode called Rick's Must Be Crazy because in it, the mad scientist has a battery power for his UFO vehicle that is made out of a mini verse of people that live inside of there that don't know that they're trapped and that they have to jump up and down on a little machine and emit energy every day so that his car can go. That's humanity right now. We've been uploaded into this fake virtual reality world where we're expected to serve the economy in order to make things keep on going, but it's not real and it's not what we're really supposed to be doing with our energy at all. Oh yes. You, but Rick and Morty does have a lot of silly fart jokes in it, but it is also very profound in many ways. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, for what you wrote. Thank you for saying that my teaching is clear and concise. I really appreciate that. I really like, strive to be able to do that. And it's hard to put these things into physical words. Um, and yes, Golden Hawk says, all it takes is one being to show that it can be done. It's like anything, it's like any achievement, running a marathon or losing 100 pounds or whatever is the thing that you need to do. The first person to do it it's always like, you can't do that. No one can do that. But then somebody does it. And it's like, no, not no one can do it. That guy did it. So yeah, I'm the first person that flying rainbow is on but I'm not the only. And I know that there are other people that are doing it, have the potential to do it. And the whole plan is for the entire planet to do it. The planet and all the planets, inhabitants and the stars and everyone and everything that lives in this solar system. And we're all doing it right now, exactly. That is that antidote that is in this Petri dish that is emanating outward. So what, and I'm really like, I'll, I'll wrap up and I'll leave it on this note. Each one of us, what we do is, oh, is there a singularity of the universe? Patricia asks, yes, this shape is extended down to the tiniest atom or the tiniest molecular component and expanded to the grandest scale. The cosmos is shaped like this. The universe, the giant supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxies is shaped like this. Everything is shaped like this. But the amazing concept is that it's all the same singularity. 
It's not a different singularity at the center. That's Patricia says, I can dance it then. That's right. We, once you understand that, everything, we can dance molecules, we can dance atoms, we can dance galaxies. And there becomes no distinction between all of that. Like, hey, in your physical presence, is there a distinction between who you are as a macroscopic individual, you know, like drinking your coffee in the morning and who you are on a cellular level? No, there's really no, no distinction. And that's what we are starting to learn. We may be little tiny organisms living on the surface of a planet, but, and we are also connected through flying rainbow lasagna to the tiniest atomic structure and the largest galactic structure. That means we're not just tiny, random, arbitrary, you know, disposable things. We're actually active participants. Like, we're not just little stupid fruit flies. We're actually intelligent, wise, meaningful fruit flies that connect with all the other things around us. So, um, so yes, the, the idea that um, uh, we have this potential and that we are fulfilling this potential right now. We live in an artificial reality that is like a simulacrum. And this flying rainbow lasagna is allowing us to become empowered occupants of the simulacrum. This isn't real reality. Real reality looks a lot more like this landscape back here. But, and, when we are submerged in this level of reality, it doesn't have to be about suffering and it doesn't have to be about limitations and, and abuse. Essentially, when we're, we're ending the dark magic um, satanic technology distortion, what we end up, we get to actually have the feeling of being here that was intentional. We were intended to have a euphoric experience. Being in a body was supposed to be like, woohoo, the most fun, the most expansive, the most wonderful experience of everything. If you think about what it would be like if we weren't constantly, you know, mentally um, degraded or physically degraded, we would all be like wonderful, wise Olympic athletes that, um, you know, always, we were artistic and musical geniuses. Uh, you know, this is what life is supposed to be like. We were constantly creating new ideas out of our mind and experiencing new things, never bored, always healthy. Like this is what we're actually supposed to be experiencing. So let me wrap it up for right now. This has turned into a very long recording, but I thank everybody who's been along with me for the journey. And I tried to fit in everything that was relevant or salient. So I hope that, that I have done so effectively. So let me just uh, finish it for right now and say thank you so much to everyone who's been here and who's participated just to finish this up for right now.